Um, so hello everyone. My name is Sam Rukiki. I'm a software engineer at Marvell Semiconductor and part of the LebNet Early and Career Steering Board. I'm very excited to be moderating this first installation in the Early and Career webinar series. And today we're really happy to be hosting a very accomplished group of entrepreneurs. But before we get to introductions, let me go through a few logistics. So we're hosting this meeting on Zoom, and we also have a live stream going on YouTube that'll be posted later to the LebNet channel. Uh, and this will be a 45 minute conversation followed by a 15 minute Q&A. So please add your questions to the Q&A section as we go through the discussion. Um, and if there are any issues with Zoom, please private message George Akiki in, in the chat. And now I'm gonna ask each of the panelists to please introduce themselves starting with Noor Shamoun, co-founder at Scopio. Hey everyone. Um, so uh, as uh, Sam said, um, I'm co-founder and uh, chief of product at Scopio, which is a little bit about what we do. It's, uh, it's an AI-based uh, image marketplace. Uh, so we sell photography to all kinds of businesses and uh, we're focused on storytelling and uh, really telling the story of every community around the world and kind of centering all kinds of human human uh, identities um, and obviously um, have a, a being very uh, data driven data driven in that way and and using AI to in order to scale our curation and uh, and photo processing um, so about myself um, I'm originally from Lebanon I moved to New York eight years ago and I've been, um, I started uh, this company with my co-founder, Christina, about seven, six, seven years ago. So, and I met um, everyone from LebNet uh, when we were in an accelerator program in San Francisco. Thank you, Noor. Uh, next up is Hento Bea, who's founder at Instavi and currently a product manager in augmented reality at Facebook. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, so I'm Hen, I'm in San Francisco, and I'm currently a product manager at Facebook. I'm working on the Ray-Ban Smart Classes. In my previous life, pre-COVID, I was the founder of InstaBeat, which was a swimming wearable tech. Uh, I'm very happy and honored to still be on entrepreneurship panels. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm, I'm hoping to give you know, some of my lessons learned now that I've seen the other side of entrepreneurship, <laughs> one of the biggest companies in the world. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Hind. And next we have Tariq Mansour, founder at Kalshi. Right. Um, so I'm Tariq, I, I run a company called Kalshi. What we're doing at Kalshi is we're building a financial exchange uh, where you can trade on the outcome of events. We can get into this a little bit more. But we're the first federally regulated exchange to be able to do this. So we broke sort of a regulatory barrier, a lot of pain for the past two years. I started coming two years ago um, and uh, Yes, we're up to. So before that, I went to MIT, uh, you know, also from Lebanon. I don't exactly know how I met LebNet, uh, but I'm very excited to be here. <laughs> Thank you, Todd. Uh, and finally, we have Fadi Zozoli, CTO at Bridge Athletic. Thank you, Samir. Hi, all. Uh, I'm uh, Fadi, CTO at Bridge Athletic. Uh, we started the business about eight years ago. We met in grad school in the Bay Area. Uh, we're in the health and fitness slash sports tech industry. We built software for uh, coaches, primarily strength and conditioning coaches want to build workouts and deliver them to their athletes, track their progress, performance. Uh, we sell and deliver pro uh, mostly uh, that software to sports teams, so professional teams uh, in the States, uh, college uh, sports programs, uh, gym chains, personal trainers. Uh, also from Lebanon, uh, prior to that, did uh, extensive studies in engineering, mostly on the software and electrical engineering side. W met LabNet when I moved to uh, the Bay Area for grad school. I've been uh, fairly involved with LabNet. I'm also on the board. We're super excited to be part of this panel today. Thank you everyone for the introductions. Uh, so the first area I would like to explore as we get into the discussion here uh, are the low points of your entrepreneurship journey and how you persevered through them. So Noor, I know you've talked in the past in interviews about challenges you faced, 
Um, would you like to elaborate? Yeah, sure. Um, so I was thinking about this earlier today and um, probably I would say that, um, the low point for me, or I mean, there are so many. Uh, <laughs> Um, and and that sometimes they, there's a lot of recurring low points, like especially when we are a company looking for outside validation and looking for funding. And that's when you get a lot of feedback. Uh, and a lot of it is from a lot of people with a lot of money who don't really know the space and don't really um, aren't really experienced or seasoned. They just they just have a lot of capital and your fate happens to be in their hands. So um we, we get told a lot that, especially in the beginning, that we're either, there's always something, we're either not a product mar- right product market fit or we're not the right team to build this product or scale it. Um, so that has been, um, it's always hard around fundraising season when, especially more towards the beginning when people uh, and VCs kind of tell us that and reject us. So it's like rejection after rejection. And it's always where you start to doubt yourself and what you're building um, and feel like there's, you know, there's no one who's going to believe in you until, you know, you get a few angels uh, who put some money in you and we're able to continue working. So I think um, along the way, I would say we learned that, you know, there, there, are, there are a lot of people who believe in the company. You just have to look hard enough to find them and obviously never give up, um, you know, uh, reaching out to different VCs. And it has to be a as a ratio, the relationship based on synergy. So it's not just going to the person who's going to invest in you, but it needs to be a, a good relationship. And uh, personally, I don't, I wouldn't prefer to, to get, uh, to be very dependent on VC money because in the end um, I wouldn't want the fate of, of my company to be in the hands of someone just because they're able to fund it. So w- I think from all of this, uh, we've learned that uh, I would prefer to have revenue rather than uh, someone giving me millions of dollars. So what we've done as a strategy is we raise a little bit every year and then we let, we just uh, rely on revenue to be able to carry us forward. And that way we're able to, to, to decide, to decide what we want to build and the, obviously the ethical uh, approach that we would take. So that's kind of my learnings from, from my low points. I see. Thank you for that. Hind, so you took an idea gleaned from years of swimming and built it into a company that eventually raised millions of dollars. I assume that wasn't easy. Um, what are some key lessons that you learned along the way? Um, it definitely wasn't easy. <laughs> um, actually, uh, to comment on that, it, um, I actually have the opposite experience. Like my whole story and journey started from passion um, and grit and perseverance was a key element to keep going despite all the challenges. Raising money was one of them, but obviously building hardware was the biggest one. And um, we've made some really expensive mistakes when it comes to building hardware. Uh, And that came, you know, a little bit from uh, being in Lebanon at first and not having the right expertise and also a little bit from my inexperience building hardware, right? Um, and so, you know, I, I can go on and on about <laughs> building hardware. Um, it's very challenging. And my main takeaway there is that you, you, you cannot hack your way through a hardware product. You really must have the right experts on your team uh, in order to build a solution that can make economical sense. Uh, I like Noor's approach to running a business I think with hardware, you have that added advantage that the business model is so clear. You sell it for more than you make it, right? Uh, You obviously need the initial capital to make it. Um, But, um, you know, when when you actually make it, you should always be thinking about the scale and how to carry this forward. Otherwise, you you will pay a very expensive price, which is what ended up happening to us in the first generation product. We've had to discontinue production because we were just losing money at some point and had to restart the design from scratch. So very, very painful lesson to learn. Uh, but you know, I, I believed in the product uh, so much. I believed in the space. I believed that there was an opportunity there and that's what kept me pushing throughout the years. And obviously the underlying layer was my passion for swimming and how much I wanted uh, the product to happen. And I was getting good signal from the market as well, right? 
Um, I think now that I'm removed from the startup world, maybe I'll give you two meta points. <laughs> the first one, I think uh, from a business side, you know, focus is key when you're a, a small company. And I think that really, really helped us doing one thing really well versus trying to do everything. Um, and the second one is that relationships are everything from relationships to your employees, to your investors, to your customers. Uh, it's really what you take with you um, you know, after this, the startup journey. Uh, and I think it's also that mentality that helps me, you know, su survive in corporate environment. It's really all about relationships at the end of the day. Um, I think a big lesson learned from the personal side, um, is I, that I had totally underestimated the mental health tax that a startup, um, can have. Um, I think I've been vocal about this before, but towards the end of my journey, I was completely burnt out. And that was a result of me just working 100% of the time and not thinking about anything else ever for 10 years. Um, I do think that you, you, you must be doing that a lot. But I think that my lesson and advice to anyone in the entrepreneurship journey is you always have to have this window that allows you to breathe and to take care of yourself outside of your startup. Because once you've entered the burnout cloud and fog, it's very hard to get out of it. Um, and so you know, it, it, it's hard to see that when you're in the journey. But now with some perspective, like it's, it's probably avoidable with the right um, attitude and force, forceful thinking. Sure. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so Fadi, you also have a, a competitive past with uh, with basketball, leading your team to the Net Lebanese national championship. Uh, coming from that experience, what lessons did you learn while guiding an athletic platform startup? Well, uh, first off, uh, definitely coming from a sports background, uh, you come with a very competitive, a lot of competitiveness in you, a lot of passion, like Hind mentioned. She's also, we're in a very similar industry, which is sports and fitness and health. Uh, we all, we both shared that passion when we were uh, starting our business. And I think uh, uh, this is something that the team hit on here, the group hit on uh, in terms of the importance of passion. Uh, but also it's a lot more important, uh, I think, uh, uh, to really know that this is a, going to be a long-term journey, a long-term commitment. Uh, Tarek mentioned that there's going to be a lot of grit involved, a lot of, uh, and then through that, you become a bit more passionate about what you're doing, about the mission, the community, the impact that you're trying to create. So definitely my background in sports uh, led me to Bridge Athletic. And uh, we met about eight years ago, uh, our uh, core team, uh, founding team, uh, was all uh, came from a sports background, incredibly competitive folks. But frankly, we're pretty naive thinking that, hey, we're going to go into this. It's going to be a year or two. Everything's going to be super like smooth. Uh, people are using Excel spreadsheets to train uh, at the highest level. It's time for software. It's going to digitize really quick and happen. And I think that's... Uh, you know, you really get into entrepreneurship, strongly believing in an idea. And then as the journey goes on, you really explore and see it unfold. And you see all of the challenges that the group covered uh, uh, here earlier today. One, one thing that I really want to focus on, and I think was very important uh, and a key learning throughout is the importance of the team. Uh, the, the, the folks you start the journey with, uh, it, it, it helped us quite a bit uh, that our uh, core team was all came from a sports background. We knew what it was like to, you know, uh, in a sense, compete as a team. Uh, you have highs and lows, both as a group and individually. And uh, you need to be with folks that now we're eight years in, we have a lot of respect to each other. We trust each other. We know that uh, each one of us is, uh, uh, really focused on what they need to be focused on and executing as well as we can. All the odds are stacked against you and starting with a fantastic core team and more importantly, being able to add team members along the way uh, that are high, high caliber as well and share those values. is just as important. Uh, 
I know we focused a lot on the uh, not so glamorous aspects of the journey, but I have to say as much as I have a lot of gray hair here, it's, it's been a lot of fun too, so. Cool. All right, so kind of on that note, we'll shift away from maybe the more negative to more positive aspects. Um, so now I kind of want to talk about what are some of the key traits that were involved in making you all kind of the su successful entrepreneurs that you are today. Um, and Tara, you kind of touched on this a few times in your last answer. Uh, but what about yourself do you believe got you to this point? Well, first, I don't know if I'm a successful entrepreneur yet. Like, <laughs> just to, to be clear, uh, I mean, I, I mean, uh, you know, like jokes aside, I, I think, I think, I guess, one thing I learned is that at the beginning, I thought, okay, you start a company and then you succeed. I think the concept of succeeding just thought, in some ways doesn't exist. It's moot. It's all relative. Like, it's like there's people below, people above, and that's always the state you're in, no matter how much you grow. And so. I, I, you know, I, I see, and maybe that's a good segue into like, what are some of the key attributes? I mean, it's, it is a journey. It, it really is like a career. It's not like, or at least that's the approach I took to it, or I learned to take to it. It's not like, you know, I, I'm building a company and then I'm selling it after two years. I, I really hope to be building this for the rest of my life. And from that perspective is, you know, if I succeeded already, so, you know, what am I still doing, right? Like there's so much still to go. Uh, but to answer a question more specifically, I guess what got me to this point um, you know, I, I would say grit. Grit is definitely the biggest one. Uh, and we, we, I mean, this is, you know, everyone shared their experiences with sort of low points. You know, it, grit got me to where, where, where I got to today. And I think grit is going to be required for the next step and the step after that. It's just, you know, problems change, but problems are always there. Like, you know, you think you face in the day one are different from the day 60 and different from the day 600, but they're all still problems and they're all equally impo as important. Um, so grit, you need to really be able to power through um, and be willing to take the risk. Like, I think what's hard about the, like, I guess what's hard about having grit, like why do most people not have grit is because they're relatively rational. They're just thinking like, okay, you know, everyone around them is, well, not everyone, but most people around them are probably telling them it's not going to work. You're often getting hit left and right by all sorts of issues. Um, the tendency or the, the, the default state is to give up. Like when, whereas the default state when you're, you know, taking a full-time job is to, is, I don't want to say succeed, but it's not to give up. You just have your full-time job, every, you know, you still have issues to face, but it's, um, you know, it's not like an entrepreneurship where, where you're starting a company where the world is dragging you towards, stopping uh, or, or giving up. And so you need to basically constantly be proactively pushing against that force, uh, which I think we can define that as grit. Um, and then the second thing, which is what I was talking about, and you know, there's people that you know, come from a certain background, you know, like swimming like for a hand where you know, something that she did for a very long time, she really understood the market and then sort of got into it. You know, I like to believe maybe not as much as hand with swimming, but I, you need to sort of you're not necessarily be an expert in your industry, but at least be willing to become an expert in your industry. Um, and I, you know, I think for me, when I felt like I really should start Kashi, it was, I was just randomly looking at financial regulation on like Friday nights, like at 11 PM, I would find myself reading the Commodities Exchange Act. And that was really a signal. I was like, okay, I should, I should work on this. Like, this is not leaving my brain. Uh, I like go to sleep with it. I wake up with it. And so I think that was a very big part of it. Like you need to be to some extent obsessed about what you're doing uh, and I have to say it. And, and, relatively unhealthy ways uh, to basically uh, be willing to sort of keep pushing. But yeah, I would say these are the two, two things. Okay. Wow. <laughs> um, and so Hind, you've, you've gone from startup back to, or maybe not back, but to the corporate world. Um, what are kind of traits that were important in, in the startup world that are still important to you today? Yeah, I smile because I, I relate to everything that it said. Um, I think, um, you know, some of the traits that I learned as part of InstaBeat that uh, have made me um, a good product manager is what they call intellectual flexibility. I call it open to feedback. <laughs> um, but, you know, having the mind, the growth mindset that you don't know everything, you uh, are doing what you know is best right now, but you're open to changing course if there's something that challenges your thinking. Uh, and I think that's really valuable because, you know, depending on how you get the feedback, 
either through your customers, your investors, etc. It's very important to have that filter where you distill what works and what doesn't work and you're open enough to pivot if you really think that the feedback is valuable. And that's something that definitely, uh, you know, it's a muscle I have to exercise every day at the startup. And surprisingly, so it's a muscle that I have to exercise very often at Facebook. Um, I agree with the that it is optimism and naivete and grit. These are all <laughs> essential for a founder. Um, I think perhaps not so much uh, as a product manager in a big company. Uh, but I think the other thing that I really took with me is that I'm very honest, direct, and real. <laughs> like I'm a very no bullshit person. And I, I don't think that's uh, true for everyone. Uh, I think that was something that was, uh, you know, people appreciated about working with me at a startup. And that's definitely something that's working for me at a big company as well. So I think, I mean, the bottom line of that is like, I was always true to myself and I was always trying to make it work for me and trying to build a company, you know, that had my values and ideals. Um, and I um, and I took that with me in the job. Um, and so, you know, it, it might not be the same case for everyone, but I think that's something that I'd really like to hold on to in every adventure I undertake. Gotcha. All right, um, so Fadi, we have a lot of early and career people watching this webinar today. And I was wondering what your advice would be to someone who's listening and thinking about starting their own company right now. It's super tough to give advice, uh, such a general <laughs> question, uh, but it's a very important question because it, you really have to, uh, when you're starting your career, you're really looking at uh, a number of different paths forward. Do I keep going in academia and go to grad school and continue going down that route versus going to a slightly more traditional path, medium, larger company, get some experience, uh, decent salary for sure. Uh, by the way, it's a lot more efficient to make money by joining that, going to that second path. At least the expected value is a lot higher. Then number three, which is starting the business or being an entrepreneur and going for it. As the group uh, mentioned, the odds are stacked against you uh, in many ways. Uh, there are a lot of hurdles along the way. Uh, so uh, I think uh, number one advice is do something that you're willing to do for a long time uh, and be stuck with the team, as I mentioned earlier, that you're willing to be stuck with for quite some time. Uh, number two, definitely don't do it for, for the, the outcome, the money. Uh, do it for the learning. In my uh, in, 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 at Bridge, I love what we do. We work with coaches, all kinds of coaches. I'm a super. I, I love sports. So even if I get out nothing out of this journey other than the learnings, learning about sports, learning about fitness, health, how to perform, how to eat better, how to live a healthy life, that in itself uh, is is a major takeaway for me. So be in a space that you're excited about. Uh, uh, you don't have to be uh, uh, just passionate about it, but know that there is something to get out of uh, it uh, and of that journey. And uh, I think going back to earlier, what Noor mentioned uh, in terms of funding the business, it's very important to be well-funded. Don't overfund the business or underfund it. it. It really depends on the space that you're in. Uh, we are, uh, we're in the space of sports traditionally funding of early stage ventures in sports, uh, especially the B2B side, uh, is not really VC-like. Uh, if you look at major companies in our industry, the Nikes, the Under Armors, the Gatorades, they tend to uh, build a brand in the space at the elite level and then work their way down to the consumer. And in that journey of working their way down to the consumer is where they go out and fundraise big rounds. So we've uh, also took a non-traditional path for our startup in a sense where we've, we've raised a, a bunch of money, but we've been running the business in a more profitable way and growing it organically for the past year or so, maybe a couple of years. Uh, and that is what we foresee doing for, uh, uh, for the next, uh, uh, maybe at least six months. <laughs> Let's see how it goes. Because the, the space is hot right now, but it's super, uh, but anyways, zooming back out, 
the takeaway is there isn't one size fits all for funding for fundraising. It all really depends on the type of journey and type of industry you're going to be you're going to be in. Okay. Um, well, thanks for the for that insight. Um, Noor, what would your advice be to an early in career person who's thinking about uh, starting a company? All the above. Um, I I love what everyone said about advice and it truly resonates with me. Uh, definitely what Fadi said about um, starting something that, or finding a problem to us, finding a solution to a problem that uh, you really think brings impact and adds value to someone's life or a group of people's life uh, lives and, and really seeing a need, a sig sig good signaling in the market for it is very important because you're gonna spend like in Hin's case, 10 years of your life possibly working on it and you're going to burn out. So you have to be very prepared to do that. Um, so obviously I won't go into that. That's kind of um, basic. And then uh, also I think what every entrepreneur knows is you really have to take risks um, and be ready to fail most of the time. And those two advice I give to myself because um, I have a background in design and technology and as a designer, I'm, I'm a perfectionist, so I'm not prone to risk-taking, which makes me a bad entrepreneur. So I have a, my partner who's a good balance. She's constantly taking risks. So we're kind of like a yin and a yang situation, but I really learned that, that perfection is truly the enemy of progress. And that's something I keep working on myself uh, constantly to improve and, and kind of unblock that um, idea. And I think something, is something that's not very talked about in terms of, what was the question? Um, oh yeah, advice given to someone. I think the, the, um, the responsibility of the technology you're building is very important to consider because in most cases that I see around me, people are excited about the solution, they're building cool AI and all those things. But, and, and especially in our case where we're trying to uh, to create proprietary AI to you know for image recognition to ba basically identify people that are not white uh, you know mm -hmm. different gender expressions different um, different ethnicities yeah. and be able to to kind of feed into the representation. So me as an Arab woman, I'd like to be represented in commercial photography everywhere. So I'd like to the AI to to mirror that. But at the same time, AI is very, can be very harmful. So we're very aware that that could, you know, potentially be sold to law enforcement agencies. So we're mm -hmm. trying to create a balance where we don't want to create something that could be used for bad because technology can, is, is not neutral. Technology is, is, can be used for anything. So I think that's really at the forefront of what I'm thinking about is what is the impact of this technology, not just building something mindlessly. Um, so uh, consulting the right people in this space to tell me and to be able to advise me on what I'm building is I'd, advice I would give to someone um, starting a, a company and having the, the power, especially someone in a tech background that's building something, think about what you're building. Thank you, that's a great answer. Um, so that, that brings our uh, general discussion to a close and uh, I'll open it up now to the audience questions. We have some um, that were sent in ahead of time, but I, I'd encourage everyone to start putting uh, some more questions in the chat. Um, so I'll start with one that, that we had had sent in from our community. Um, and we touched on this a little bit just now, uh, but what technology trends do you all see impacting uh, your ventures in the future? Um, what do you see kind of out there uh, that's coming? Um, and maybe Todd, do you want to take this one? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think for us, uh, I don't know if it's technology, maybe it's the space, but uh, I think definitely FinTech and banking is getting, uh, there's, there's like a, some sort of renaissance happening right now uh, where, you know, I mean, this might get a little technical and boring. I don't know how much people care about this, but like, you know, the bottom line is the banking system sucks. Payment rail sucks. 
the way you pay a credit card from a business perspective, that sucks. It's actually surprising how much it sucks. Um, and you get to know how much it sucks when you have to build a business that's accepting payments and so that's dealing with money. And, you know, as an exchange, we are, in some respects, you know, our clearinghouse is an issuer of money. So we have a number of things where we're deep, deep sort of financial technology and fintech. And the more you get into it, the more you realize that you would be surprised by how inefficient a swipe of a card is or how inefficient like a, like ACH. ACH is one of the worst payment rails and, you know, places like Robinhood and Coinbase and all these other places. From a customer perspective, it's super easy. You just do a swipe. But, uh, but yeah, we're seeing a whole, I mean, you probably see, you know, fintech, uh, a lot of, a big chunk of fintech is actually neobanking and sort of new payment rails. And I think that's going to make payment infrastructure a lot more efficient in the U.S. in the next few years, in the next five to seven years, I would say. But yeah, I don't know if that was interesting, but that's a... Yeah, that's, exciting, no, no, yeah, that's true, but, you know. <laughs> um, So we're getting a couple questions here uh, on mentorship. Um, let's see. So what areas would you have liked to have more mentoring in um, the, to help reduce some of the barriers you faced early on? Um, and, and I guess maybe a corollary to that is where, where did you eventually find the answers to those questions? I don't know if anyone wants to volunteer. Thank you, Patty. <laughs> right, well, uh, I think this hits a, a bit on uh, the, and I'm gonna answer this within the context of when we were starting the business initially uh, getting men mentorship, uh, and I'll answer it from a technical standpoint, given that my background is technical. I think that a lot of things that you learn in school, at least back then, uh, uh, were academically very cool, uh, but then going out and executing uh, on a, uh, uh, in the real world is very different. So getting mentorship in the form of really understanding how do you actually build a software that scales how do you build a solid product? How do you design a product experience? How do you really make sure that you're data-driven and uh, finding the need, addressing it, and uh, uh, you know, driving product, driving technical innovation within the company? Uh, uh, all of that stuff is really uh, super, super important. Now, in terms of where do you get that information, some of it is could be a, a gain just uh, with a lot of resources that are out there on the internet. Uh, so you can read a lot, a lot of really good material out there. Uh, and then mentorship uh, is, is, also, is also a venue to, uh, to learn a lot from folks who are experienced and who have done it before. As a first-time entrepreneur, you make a lot of mistakes that other first-time entrepreneurs have made and can be easily acquired by someone who's gone through that journey before. And I think that's one thing to look into if you are, and that's an advice, if you're looking to start a business, it can be super uh, valuable to have someone on your team or it initially who's done it before. Because folks who have done it before, they, they know uh, how to avoid certain obstacles and mistakes, uh, both on the team level, business level, product, technical as well. So uh, I, I found a bunch of people who I looked up to, uh, uh, in the Bay Area, uh, met with them, learned a lot from them, uh, both technically and building like, uh, on all aspects of starting a business. Uh, so mentorship is invaluable. You can learn a lot. Uh, I met some folks through LabNet, actually, who were great sources uh, of, uh, of input. Uh, I know uh, Hind and I uh, uh, had a lot of discussions around uh, startups as well along the, uh, along the way. So other entrepreneurs who are also going through the journey, you can all learn from each other as well. I, I would add to that, like plus one to everything Fadi said, and I would add, I would have loved some mentorship on from established, I mean, I've, I've had it right, but I think what was super valuable to me is all the soft life skills. And so how do you deal with a board member that has just said this thing you don't know how to answer to or someone who can help you through your life crisis of what the hell am I doing? Because that happens quite often when you're a startup founder. And so I think getting those answers for someone who's been through this before and who's gotten to a place, um, you know, that's aspiring 
Um, I think th those were, you know, the types of help that were super invaluable to me um, that I think we can all benefit from. Gotcha. Uh, okay, let's see here. Sounds good. So uh, Peter is also asked a question that's pretty similar to one we had sent in. Um, going back to kind of the start of your journeys, what was a, a pivotal moment maybe coming out of school where you decided that you wanted to go towards um, entrepreneurship uh, and, and maybe who helped you in that early moment? Um, Nor would you like to take this one? Uh, hmm. I can't think of a specific mentor um, that kind of helped me in early stages, but we did go through a few um, two accelerator programs that um, was very um, kind of valuable to our learning process. And it felt like another, you know, master's program for me to be able to be, I have no business background. So I was able to learn a lot about the market and uh, making good business decisions. And I think um, one of the valuable things I'd say I learned that are, uh, that has taught me good life skills is coming from my education as a designer, as a technologist, uh, having kind of a, having the intersection of that with making good business decisions. So being uh, kind of a, a full rounded um, professional, I would say is um, uh, not just building technology, but figuring out what the impact that is and if that's actually needed in the market. Um, and that's something that um, I attribute to a lot of mentors for teaching uh, me, maybe indirectly that. Um, so that that's what I would say. Cool. Um, so uh, another another question that was sent in. Um, so being of Lebanese descent is definitely a, a mixed bag of emotions these days, coming from pride um, to to kind of worry about the current situation in Lebanon. What do you see your role as a member of the Lebanese diaspora? Is that question to me or? Anyone. <laughs> I know it's probably a, a hard question to answer. It's a hard question. I think being Lebanese I mean, no matter how long you live in the US, you're always Lebanese, right? It's such a strong culture. And I think at least for me, I wave the flags up and high no matter where I am. So, um, you know, part of it is spreading our culture, which is truly unique and amazing. Part of it is being part of a community of like-minded people. You know, it's very unique to be a Lebanese person in Silicon Valley or in the US. We have a common shared experience. So creating that network and community and LebNet has been a true enabler of that. It, it, it's really unique and special. And I think for us, you know, when we go through adventures and experiences and learnings, I think we all feel the commitment and duty to give back. Um, you know, so Fadi actually and I are on the board of LebNet and we are uh, really trying to hone in on this aspect of LebNet and trying to create programs for people who are, you know, I, I don't know if we're, we're not called mid-career, right? Maybe, I don't know, quarter career. <laughs> and um, how can we engage better? How can we leverage what we learn? And how can we create a shared experience and community? Um, because we truly share something unique. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe I can add, I mean, you know, I definitely cannot dare to claim that, you know, I, 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 I you know, uh, I'm doing enough for any, I mean, I, I don't know, but I think it's like small things. I think that, you know, I like what Hint said, it's like, you're always Lebanese, no matter what. I mean, you know, uh, and, you know, one thing at least that I experience is, you know, for, for the name of the company, Kalshi, is, is a pretty weird name, especially for like Americans. I got a lot of pushback. You know, my board really complained about it. They really wanted to change it, you know, even sort of try to acquire the name Spock. And I was really kind of the only, I really wanted to stick to Kalshi because Kalshi, you know, I, I, we got it from Kilshi and it was really, I mean, it's Lebanese. And, you know, I like the fact that every time they talk about the company, there is some Lebanese spin to it. There's Lebanon mentioned somehow, somewhere, right? 
uh, which with time might sort of like lessen, but I, you know, I, I'm excited about the idea of, a, you know, of a Lebanese sounding name um, potentially getting there, right? And, and I think a little bit of the, the, the idea is, I don't know if you remember the company called Chobani. Uh, well, probably you are, but you know, I, I don't know if you know, you should read, read that founder's story. I, I guess that's, that's an advice I would tell you. Absolutely amazing, Hamdi is amazing. Uh, and, and, you know, even the name and how it was picked. So, so there's a few things that, you know, it's small things, but I think that sometimes the small things matter. Mm-hmm. Cool. This is awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. We just want to add a couple of things here to sure. the group set, uh, because uh, what, what Tari mentioned, small things do matter and go a very long way. Uh, if, uh, uh, you know, for folks who are listening, if you're in the in the middle of a journey you have your company whether you're at a startup or a larger company uh, an internship even for a student in lebanon can go a very long way especially now we're in a remote world it's much easier to get people who are in lebanon involved it's a lot more uh, flexible uh, to do so so there are a lot of ways to give back uh, whether it is mentorship internship uh, to a uh, lebanese student especially going through these times uh, and for the folks who are in Lebanon, uh, who are listening in, it's also in the middle of this chaos. And it's, I know it's, uh, uh, it can be overwhelming. Uh, it's all, there are a lot of shifts happening around us, going back to the question of trend with remote work. Everything's getting digitized a lot faster than expected. Uh, it's, it's a decent time to start a business. If you've been passionate about it for some time, you're in Lebanon, you have a few, uh, good friends and you're really excited about doing something uh, definitely not for the Lebanese market but for a, uh, for, for, for more of a global solution uh, it's a good time to look into it now so do it I agree with Fadi um, I, yeah I feel like being Lebanese in a, a country that's so abundant like the US it has so many it's like there's brain drain in Lebanon and, and everyone in the world is just coming to this land of opportunity. Um, so we're all here for selfish reasons, of course, because we wanna um, advance our careers and our personal life and all that. Um, so I feel like personally for me, I feel this conflicting thing where I'm here and I'm comfortable, but I don't really want to give back to the US because the US has a million of me and doesn't really need me. I wanna give back to my countries, Lebanon and Palestine, because, you know, it's not great. Um, so so there's, there's this whole conflicting thing. So I love what Fadi said about, um, you know, you're in this situation, you're not here nor there, you're kind of somewhere in the middle and you give back how you can. Um, you hire, you know, uh, Lebanese talent uh, in Lebanon. We have in our, our team, we're about 14 people and half half of them are based in Lebanon, which I really love mm-hmm. uh, because there's so much awesome. talent over there and there's a, an economic crisis. So it's really affordable actually to hire people um, at, a, at a decent salary in Lebanon. So um, definitely, I think that's really important to, to give back in that way. And and people learn a lot because there's no there's not much many opportunities in Lebanon. So people learn a lot when they're working with companies that have the resources, like even startups like ours that are based in the US. We have so much access that doesn't really exist in Lebanon. Maybe, maybe one thing I'd add, maybe that's a flip of this, but I think one thing Lebanese people are bad at is like asking for advice or asking for, for help, which is actually like in the US, it's a lot more commonplace. Uh, and you know, I think that's, I mean, I guess maybe it's not directly related to the question, but I, I think Mm-hmm. One thing I've found is that the advice I always get from, from our, our board members, Alfred, is, is, is no to ask. Uh, knowing to ask is actually a very, very strong skill to develop over time, which is basically, uh, you know, like have your network and know how to use it uh, and, and how to, I mean, quote unquote, use people. It's not you're using them in a bad way, just like get them to where you want to get. And oftentimes people are actually, especially people that are like, let's say, you know, 10x kind of further in their life, they are actually a lot more likely to help you. Uh, because I think I, I, I would attribute it mostly because people feel good when they help others. So it's still selfish, but you know, they're feeling good. You're advancing with what you want to do. And, and, and that the whole thing is actually makes it a lot easier. And that's something that I learned over time. Um, and, and I think we have the concept of Aib in Lebanon, 
I, I, it actually, it's not, you know, we have this kind of intrinsic Ayyub thing that actually is not as real. It's, you know, you can actually go up to like pretty successful people and be like, look, you know, uh, put, it, put a small check in the company and then help me with a bunch of different things. And then oftentimes they're willing to do it. It's small check. They don't really care. They would probably spend it on a weekend uh, in, I don't know, like in the Bahamas or something. Um, and then you kind of got to the next step in your company. So I think that's just something that I also learned over time. Like, I, I think there's no I have in business. But yeah. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Looks like there's been a few requests for uh, connection in the, in the chat. Um, but I don't have any more questions here. Uh, and it's like, I think we got to everything in the chat. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and, and bring this to an end here. Um, thank you so much to all of our panelists uh, for taking the time and, and giving us all this great insight into, into their startups and how to get involved. Um, I hope that we've inspired some future entrepreneurs and we can have this panel again in five years with some of the attendees here. Um, but uh, thank you so much again to, to everybody who attended and, and to the panelists. Uh, just a reminder, this webinar will be available on the, on the LevNet YouTube channel. Uh, and please stay tuned for future LevNet webinars and early in career social events. Thanks again to everyone and uh, have a good weekend. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Bye, good luck.